If you make a portion of the law, a segment of the law, aspect of what the law obliges, constitutive of your justification in part, contributing to the maintenance, preservation, and ultimate justification of any person, you have a form of, call it Mm semi-Pelagianism, or a form of legalism that may not be the same form of legalism in the full-blown Pelagian sense, but it's still grace plus. Welcome to Mid-America Reformed Seminary's Roundtable Podcast, a broadcast where the faculty of Mid-America discuss everything from Reformed theology, cultural issues, and all things seminary. This is episode 94, and I'm your host, Jared Luchibor. Thank you for tuning in. With the new perspective on Paul outlined and described for us by the professors in our last episode, they move on in today's episode to examine the new perspective a little more closely, giving an analysis and critique of this assessment of Paul. So last time we were seeking to describe something about the new perspective, its origins with E.P. Sanders especially, and then some of its uh, its, its basic focus initially on what does Second Temple Judaism teach or not? Is it properly called legalistic or not, we looked a little bit about what Sanders said there. Uh, and then from that flows the question of, okay, well, if Judaism believed X, Y, or Z, and that's its own debate, um, what then is Paul disagreeing with his contemporary Jews about or not? So there's those two questions. Um, the first one then, Sanders in his thesis has kicked off quite a lot of discussion and, and uh, analysis about Uh, Judaism itself. Uh, We don't want to misrepresent it. We want to be fair to a body of literature and a a host of people who lived uh, and and wrote and and believed various things. So we should talk some about that. Uh, What has been some of the upshot in the wake of Sanders' claims uh, regarding uh, reassessing Second Temple Judaism? Yeah, well, he has, as, as um, Marcus, you read through that famous uh, definition that, that uh, Sanders gave of the contours of... Covenantal of the, nomism. Yeah, covenant of the pattern of religion that, that supposedly evidenced. And, and there's been then a, a number of scholars then going back into these texts and saying, well, is this what we find? And especially, is this a, is this a consistent thing? And scholars have found, you know, you can think, for example, uh, of this this two volume set that D. A. Carson, Peter O'Brien, and Mark uh, Seifried uh, edited, Justification and Variegated Nomism. The first volume was sort of an effort to go back into these these Second Temple Jewish texts and say, can we find this pattern here? And what they found was, in some cases, yes, we do find the pattern there um, of this of this sort of very gracious Judaism. However, in other texts. We found something very different. No, we did find, uh, I mean, crass legalism, as it were. And, and so it came to, to show that, wait a minute, you can't just take this corpus of literature called Second Temple Judaism and, and, and assume that it is this perfectly consistent batch of, of material and then make that uh, the thing that Paul is responding to and rewrite Paul. So in some ways, the upshot has been that while past Protestant, especially German Lutheran scholarship, but in general, Protestant scholarship has been reductionistic in one direction about Second Temple Judaism. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sanders was reductionistic in another way, in another direction, particularly because what he paints with a fairly broad brush and simply says that there's one pattern of religion mm-hmm. in the Second Temple period. It's covenantal nomism, and it's gracious, not legalistic. But when you what you actually look when you find uh, what you actually find when you look is uh, a, a spectrum of greater emphasis on grace, medium emphasis on grace, very little emphasis on grace. In a sense, you might say, and that gets us into questions of well, what exactly constitutes legalism or not? Because mm-hmm. if you look, for example, in Galatians three. Uh, the Judaizers that Paul's uh, opposing in Galatians were clearly teaching grace mm-hmm. and works, as Paul sees it, right? That you begin in the spirit, but you continue in the flesh or in the law, right? 
In other words, it's what Galatians 3 teaches sounds a good bit like what covenantal gnomism uh, uh, supposedly is. The whole upshot then would we, we have to be more specific. Mm-hmm. And a subsequent evaluation of Second Temple Judaism would say there's a spectrum of degrees of grace, views of grace, and how much the law came into play. But at the same time, I think conservative scholarship especially, but even uh, some who are very much a part of the broader New Testament guild, John Barclay, for example, uh, in his recent book on Paul and the gift, has tried to helpfully be more specific to say, well, what do we mean by grace? And do we mean at any point grace alone? Or do we mean grace plus a little bit of other things, right? Mm-hmm. If we get in by grace and then we're maintained in God's covenant by obedience and also some extra atonement, so kind of a twofold my obedience plus the atoning acts that I do through the sacrificial system, is that grace alone? Is that what the Old Testament taught or what, you know? So the point has been Judaism is much more diverse in the time period, and that is important in and of itself, but even more subtle forms of legalism or uh, grace plus something are still in conflict with what Paul and Jesus and others were talking about. I think that's what leads us then in particular to, you know, getting into more Pauline texts uh, and elsewhere in the New Testament as well to define more closely what is uh, the the debate. Uh, It's not enough to use legalism there's only legalism if we're pelagians uh charles hodge is reputed to have said that the ghost of pelagius is of concern to the church a kind of crass legalism but the ghost of semi pelagius <laughs> is even of more concern partly because it's more subtle and uh cornell i wonder if you might want to speak to some of those issues which you've of course written on a good bit i would I would like to start with something of a historical or history of doctrine observation. A lot of the new perspective authors will argue that the the reformers made a mistake when they judged Roman Catholic teaching about salvation, particularly justification, as legalistic, that they were sort of engaged then in opposing a form of legalism, much like the kind of legalism that is opposed in the New Testament and particularly in Paul's epistles when he's contending with these Judaizers who are requiring some sort of works of the law in order, if not to become a member of God's covenant community, at least be maintained and preserved in that relationship. But I think there's a a pretty serious error that you, Marcus, were getting at uh, in your own way that is made at this point, and I don't accuse New Testament and biblical theologians of not being aware of the history of doctrine, but actually the the Reformers were not opposing legalism of the purest Pelagian sort. The Roman mm-hmm. Catholic Church uniformly condemned Pelagianism, any kind of simplistic moralism where we're saved simply by virtue of our performance. They taught grace bringing you in prevenient grace, sufficient grace, not a grace that saves absent your cooperation freely and independently with it, but it was a grace plus works paradigm, Mm -hmm. if I may put it that way. And so when the reformers were insisting upon grace alone and with respect to justification that it's grace alone and the work of Christ is received through faith alone— Though that faith may be a working faith, it's not by virtue of its working. It receives, embraces, looks outside of itself to Christ. Why is this an important point? Well, it's an important point because what Sanders calls a pattern of religion where you get in by God's election, initiative, grace, mercy, and are preserved in a variety of ways, but maintained particularly by your faithfulness to some degree in doing what the law requires, you actually have a pattern of religion that is very similar formally right. to what was taught by the Roman Catholic Church. So that's, that's just a general observation, but I want to come to where the issue has become most uh, focused and of concern, I think, to anyone who really 
receives the Reformation and what it taught about grace alone and justification by grace alone and the kind of the work of Christ alone and that to be received by faith alone, that a new doctrine or formulation is articulated. Now, it's complex because, you know, I think it was James D.G. Dunn who said we shouldn't speak of new perspective singular, we should speak of new perspectives. Yeah. And there's a range of opinion. And mm-hmm. so I'm only, mm-hmm. I'm generalizing. But if I generalize, if you ask the question, well, then what was Paul opposing if not legalism? Because there was no legalism extant at the time of the writing of the New Testament in Second Temple Judaism. Was it merely that these uh, people, well, it couldn't be that because these were members of the community of faith. They received Christ as the Messiah. What what accounts for the intensity of Paul's opposition to those who were stipulating certain works or acts in obedience to the law, such as circumcision, possibly feast day observances, uh, the fulfillment of certain portions of the Levitical legislation regarding um, the conduct of God's covenant people, if it wasn't works of the law in the general sense of any act of obedience to the law, what is he opposing? And it's at this point that Sanders makes, or I should say Dunn, makes a particularly significant contribution by arguing that when Paul is contending against Judaizers who require works of obedience to the law or works of the law in order to be justified, he's not talking about the moral requirement of the law. He's really talking about a social question of what identifies and marks off as a distinguishing characteristic those who are members of God's covenant community. In fact, I think Don uses the language boundary marker requirements that distinguish the Jew from the Gentile mm-hmm. or those who belong to those whom God recognizes as his covenant people and those who don't. And these boundary marker requirements are basically threefold. It's circumcision, it's uh, dietary restrictions, and it's um, feast days, feast mm-hmm. day observances, new moon Sabbaths and mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Um, And so Paul is not contending against a broadly legalistic form of Judaism. He's contending with Judaizers who wanted to, in a sense, sharply demarcate what are the requirements for association with and incorporation into the covenant people of God. And they were insisting that these kinds of boundary marker requirements, they were not talking about obedience to the law in its entirety and all of its obligations. They were talking, you you need to become, in a sense, a Jew. It was an ecclesiological, they all often express it, issue, not so much a soteriological issue. Justification doesn't have so much to do with where do I stand in relation to God? Does he accept me? Am I in Christ righteous and acceptable to him as I receive Christ through faith? The real issue was who belongs to the covenant family and what's required to be uh, a member of that community. As a result, uh, when you read Paul's arguments in Romans and in Galatians, that's the Judaism against which he's writing, this kind of ethnic uh, separationism or this view of God's people as a peculiar people by virtue of their being distinguished in these respects from others. They keep the law in respect to these kinds of boundary marker requirements. And so the real issue is a social distinction between peoples who are in and people who are outside of the uh, uh, people of God. The doctrine of justification as a result really is a social doctrine that Uh, represents what it takes to become a member of the community, the family of God, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what it takes is not obedience to these boundary marker requirements of the law, but faith in Christ as the promised Messiah of the Old Testament scripture. Faith isn't, it it becomes a badge of Mm -hmm. distinction. Maybe this will confuse our hearers, but 
I'm always reminded of Paul Helm's comment at some point that the new perspective at this juncture reduces faith in Christ to something like the badge that a Boy Scout is required to have to be admitted into the company of those who are recognized as. It doesn't have anything to do with a question of am I as a person who has not kept the law, I'm under the law and under its condemnation, as a sinner who is unable to be found acceptable to God, and I need a Savior, the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ, to do under the law, both in the way of his positive obedience to what the law requires, uh, and in terms of his suffering, the liability of the law, in taking the burden, being put to death for our sins, as Paul puts it in Romans 4, and raised for our justification. That's all a misconstrual of what justification is all about. The real debate is who belongs and who doesn't. What does it take to be identified and recognized by God as a legitimate member of his uh, worldwide family, the Church of Jesus Christ, Jew and Gentile alike? Um, And what it takes is the badge of faith, the acknowledgement that Jesus Christ is Israel's Messiah, and he is the Lord. Uh, It isn't believing in Christ in the sense of accepting and receiving what is promised us in him, namely that we come to share in his righteousness in terms of his fulfillment of all the obligations of the law. I've been talking a little bit at length here, so I'll just pause and see if my (laughs) colleague Marcus or— Well, I think, you know, just part of what you're—the variety of things here, but part of what you're getting at is um, if it's if it's faith plus obeying the whole law, that's a kind of legalism. If it's faith plus the necessity of obeying certain parts of the law for justification, for getting into the covenant and being a member of the people of God, then that's also a kind of legalism. In mm-hmm. other words, again, there's a spectrum. It's not just the more blatant, crass forms that are in fact legalistic, but more subtle forms are as well. And so even in the way that, say, Dunn is trying to articulate things, he thinks he has grace and works in a more subtle perspective, but from the vantage point of our Reformed understanding and our interpretation of Paul and other texts, this is still a grace plus certain forms of works are necessary. This is what the Judaizers in Mm -hmm. Galatians are saying, and, and Paul rejects out of hand even that more subtle form of legalism as causing one to fall away from Christ, right? You're severed from Christ, you who adopt circumcision, Mm -hmm. if you're adopting it as a necessary requirement to be a part of God's people, right? So that... that If I may use a lovely Latin expression, pars pro toto, Mm -hmm. the part for the whole. Mm -hmm. I read the Apostle Paul... In, for example, Galatians 5, when he opposing the Judaizers, say, if you do what you're asking, that is, concede that there are certain requirements, not all, but these boundary marker requirements, most especially circumcision, that will gain you entry into and recognition as a member of God's covenant people, you become a debtor to the whole law. You know, similarly, he argues earlier in Galatians that uh, we're all cursed whether Jew or Gentile, if we do not continue in, note, well, all things written in the book of the law to do them. And if I remember it correctly, some of the things he says in that immediate context appealing to Deuteronomy include requirements in the law that go far beyond what this more restrictive sense of merely the boundary marker requirements. So you're absolutely right, Marcus. If you if you make a portion of the law, a segment of the law, aspect of what the law obliges, constitutive of your justification in part, or uh, contributing to the maintenance, preservation, and ultimate justification of any person, you have a form of, call it semi-Pelagianism, mm-hmm. or a form of legalism that may not be the same form of legalism in the full-blown Pelagian sense, but it's still grace plus. It's still something you need to do, and it's not accidental, I think, that 
N.T. Wright, another important writer in the New Perspective trajectory, uh, can say very straightforwardly that justification occurs in three distinct modes. Your first incorporation into Christ, your subsequent maintenance and preservation in the faith, and your ultimate final justification in the context of final judgment, which he puts it rather straightforwardly in his commentary on Romans, is based upon the whole life that you have lived. Mm -hmm. So now you're back to yourself, to your performance, what you have contributed, in addition to what God, by his initiating grace and mercy, but that's not enough. It doesn't ultimately procure that final justification. You know, and that's highly relevant for thinking about the nature of this debate between biblical scholarship, very narrowly described, and theological scholarship, which in some ways is looking at this more more broadly. Because, again, so much of this material has come out of biblical scholarship, which we have two of those kind of people here. Uh, we do tend to be very narrow and ask very narrow questions, and we can become very biblicistic. And in fact, some people uh, have, have would object saying, well, Pelagianism, these, you're, you're being anachronistic with terms. But in, in fact, that's one thing biblical scholars can do, is we can, we can get very narrow on a set of questions and fail to appreciate how there's other factors at work. And so, for example, um, a lot of these Jewish texts, and I know I keep coming back to that because, again, this is, this is purported to, uh, to show us that Paul couldn't have been dealing with somebody who is like a semi-Pelagian. But, you know, even uh, I think G.K. Beale has, has, uh, anal- has given kind of a good way of thinking about this. He says, look, some of these sources um, show that there is, these Jewish sources, so that there is some kind of an independent human contribution within Sanders' broader framework of grace that issues in the final salvation, which is a synergistic notion comparable to the medieval semi-Pelagianism that, that Luther confronted. All right, there are... Okay, sure, it's not called Pelagianism, but there are elements that really are the same. And so uh, when later theologians are speaking of Roman Catholicism, and, and, and as you mentioned earlier, the objection was not that, well, Catholics don't believe in grace, Catholics don't believe in faith. No, it was that they, they have a system that is not arguing for salvation by grace alone, through faith alone. Um, the key word is alone. <laughs> and... Uh, and this is exactly what we have going on here. And it's it's interesting too, and, and maybe I'm I'm pivoting too much trying to just get my word in before the timer goes off here, but but I am struck by you do have some language in Paul. It, take for example Ephesians two. You know, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now, here's, here's a well-known passage in, you know, that we cite in our theological formulation, and yet it is one that you find uh, new perspective writers kind of um, hemming and hawing a bit on. Part of that, and I think, Marcus, you can correct me, some of these writers do dispute whether Ephesians is Pauline. Now, N.T. Wright, for example, in his, in his actual book on justification, kind of a follow-up, more popular treatment that he wrote after a lot of, of, of this had been analyzed. He, he's he's referring to Ephesians as Paul, although he does even seem to say, "Well, but this is the only place where Paul speaks in this way." And you see him kind of trying to to soften what are some of the implications theologically of a passage like this, especially as it might relate to a consistency within Paul's thought. I think that you know we could say in Galatians five, for example, um, that Paul is directly acknowledging that his Jewish contemporaries are not all crassly legalistic. They have a more moderate, modified position. So in that sense, it's acknowledging something of what, in a sense, you might say the new perspective is is saying. There's not this straw man crass legalism. But Paul also draws the line very sharply to say, even that is wrong. Mm. And in fact, he goes a step further and to say, if you're going to adopt the law, Christ plus law, you really need to go all the way. You need to obey the whole law. It's it's Paul who widens the gulf between what could be considered a gracious soteriology and a legal soteriology and insists that these these, um, middle road positions – 
are in fact incorrect and they and and they are destructive and to be consistent with what the law actually is they really need to be you need to choose sides in a sense right mm-hmm. you need to go grace alone or you need to go the whole law those are the two options yeah this middle and, this middle ground is uh, right and so even as we is already to choose we we would <laughs> ro- appropriately say that much second temple Judaism is not describing a crass legalism it's not advocating for that it doesn't mean it gets grace and law in the right perspective as as Sanders sought to say, the Apostle Paul is is really trying to say, no, these middle road positions are deceptively sounding grace-filled, but they're not grace alone. And, and that, of course, is exactly, you know, the, the Roman Catholic religion was and is very much a religion of grace plus works or a, a combination. And so uh, the new perspective has, has prompted... Um, initially a reductionistic view of Judaism of an opposite kind from what Protestants have taken uh, in the past. That's led to further more nuanced discussion of what Jews of the Second Temple period thought, non-Christian Jews. And then, I think, to more nuanced views of the range of positions with which the Apostle Paul and the other writers of the New Testament profoundly disagree. Grace alone, right? I think that's uh, in in a lot of ways what the upshot of this conversation uh, in dialogue with a new perspective has has been in the end. Continuing their analysis and critique of the new perspective on Paul next week, Reverend Compton, Dr. Minninger, and Dr. Venema explore more of the use of extra biblical texts that are used in order to promote this perspective. For more episodes, you can find us on our website at midamerica.edu slash podcasts and wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Be sure to search for and subscribe to Mid-America Reform Seminaries Roundtable. I'm Jared Luchibor. Till next time.